Okay, so in this fourth lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the properties of uh, this particular example of a continuous random variable, the normal distribution, the normal random variable. Okay, so the main points in my previous lecture that I want to remind you of is that we saw what the probability density function of the normal distribution was, right? So the normal random variable, and I also pointed out this very important fact that unlike a discrete random variable where you can ask about the probabilities of particular outcomes in the support of x, in the continuous case, the probability of a particular outcome is always zero. And the reason for that is that we're talking about continuous values, right? If you've got an infinite range of possible values, the sum of their probabilities has to sum to one. But if it's infinite, how are you going to achieve that? So the way the probability is defined in a continuous random variable is by computing the area under the curve for a particular range of values, right? So you can, as you can imagine, you can approximate the area under a curve by computing a rectangle, right? By drawing a rectangle. Let me just quickly show you this graphically in a toy example. Right, so you could draw something like this. This is a distribution, right? Now, this is the x-axis. This is the real number line here, right? So I could actually approximate the area under the curve by drawing a rectangle here between these two points, Q2 and Q1, right? And now if I decrease this area between Q1, this length between Q1 and Q2 to zero, I would get the point value for Q2, the probability of the uh, value Q2, Q2, and that number would have to be zero because the rectangle will just become a line. The area under uh, area of a rectangle is length times breadth. If the breadth is zero, then the probability is zero, right? So that's the intuition that I want to get across to you here, that because the area under the curve it defines the probability of a range of possible outcomes, the probability of one particular outcome is always going to be zero. So if you ask a question like, what's the probability of observing 500 milliseconds, right? In a reading study, for example, the answer would be zero, okay? Always. Okay, now the CDF of a continuous uh, random variable will allow us to work out these kinds of probabilities, the, the area under the curve, by carrying out that summation in the continuous space, which is called integration. So let's unpack some of the important properties of normal distribution. These are very important ideas that you have to keep in mind in the future when we start actually doing some statistical modeling. Okay? So the first important case that I will illustrate, I will illustrate this with something called a standard normal distribution. This is a special case of the normal distribution where the mean is zero, mu is zero, and the standard deviation is one. Okay? So this is called the standard normal, and we are going to use this distribution, the standard normal, in our statistical modeling later on. It's going to be a bread and butter distribution for us. So it's a very important one. So one thing to understand about the normal distribution in general is that um, the area under the curve, well, let's talk about the standard normal. The area under the curve in the standard normal distribution ranging from plus one to minus one on the real number line will be 68%, right? So plus one, minus one away from the mean will cover an area of 68%, okay? If I, if I look at the broader range between plus two and minus two, the area covered by in the standard normal is 95%, right? But technically, I'm not being very precise here, technically it's minus 1.96 to uh, plus 1.96, right? But uh, I'm just being a little sloppy and saying plus two, minus two, just because it's approximately 1.96, right? So I, I don't want to get hung up on two decimal points here, two decimal places here, right? So between plus two and minus two is 95% of the area under the curve. And I mean, I could go on, right? But another example is between plus three and minus three, right? Remember that this, the real number line is going all the way to plus infinity on the right and all the way to minus infinity on the left. Okay, that's the support of x, right? So I can't draw infinity here. So that's why I just cut it off at three. But plus, between plus three and minus three, I have 99.7% of the area under the curve, 
right? So these are important properties of the standard normal random variable, right? More generally, talking about any normal distribution with some mu or some some mean mu and some um, standard deviation sigma, right? You can uh, it will always be true that plus one times the standard deviation and minus one times the standard deviation, that interval will always contain 68% of the area under the curve, right? Plus two, minus two standard deviations around the mean, of course, right? Will contain 95% of the area under the curve and plus three, minus three times the standard deviation will cover 99.7% uh, of the area under the curve, right? This is a fact about the normal distribution. It just comes about because of the shape of this distribution, right? Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about the values on the x-axis. I'll call them quantiles, okay? Because I'm gonna need that term later on, but you should remember that these are just the elements in the support of x in this particular distribution, okay? All right, so one very important aspect of a probability density function is that a probability density function usually has not usually, it always has two components. One component is the normalizing constant and the other component is the kernel, okay? So let's look at this idea in the case of the normal distribution, right? So if the normal distribution has two terms and one of them is this term with the exponential here, right? There was something else before that that I have dropped, right? And the second part of the normal distribution is called the kernel of the distribution. I'm just calling it g of x to separate it, to distinguish it from f of x, right? And what's interesting about this kernel is that this kernel actually defines the shape of that distribution. The distinctive shape that we have of the normal distribution comes from this kernel. However, without the normalizing constant, the area under the curve is not going to sum to one, which is bad news for us if we want to use this as a probability density function. So let me quickly show you that if I just define a function with the kernel of the normal distribution, right, that's what I've done here. I just created a function called the norm kernel, which contains just the kernel part of the, this distribution here written up here, right? And then what I did is I take this function integrate and I use this function in R to compute the area under the curve for this particular kernel, ranging from minus infinity to plus infinity, which is the support of x. And what you should see is something very disturbing, that the total area under the curve is 2.5. So this is not a proper probability distribution now, because the, all the possible outcomes probability has to sum to one. It can't sum to 2.5 here. So that's, that's the problem with the kernel. And the way this is fixed is, uh, fixed is by adding the second term in the normal distribution, which is called the normalizing constant. So what I want to show you in this plot, though, is that the shape of the distribution, of course, has not changed, right? It's still a normal distribution. What has changed is that the area on the curve now is uh, larger than one. So that's a problem, and we can easily fix that by putting in that normalizing constant. So that, that was the missing part, you know, that I dropped in my function g of x, which I showed you a few minutes ago in the kernel. And so if I write the full normal distribution now with the kernel and the normalizing constant, here's the normalizing constant, here's the kernel, right? Now if I integrate the area under the curve, so sum up the area under the curve, going from minus infinity to plus infinity, I will get an area of one. So now it's a proper probability density function. So the point I want to get across here is that a probability density function is gonna have a normalizing constant and it's gonna have a kernel. The kernel determines the shape of the distribution. The normalizing constant makes sure that the area under the curve sums to one. That is, that is a proper probability uh, density function, okay? All right, so <clears throat> what you should notice here, this is the full normal distribution normalized properly, right? What you'll notice here is that the the height of this, this curve has changed, right? Compared this y-axis with the one I showed you earlier. It was going much higher, right? That's because there's more area under the curve. So that's why it ends up more than two. With the normalizing constant, it rescales the distribution so that the area under the curve is one, okay? 
very important idea. We will need this later when we are doing Bayesian analysis. Okay? One general point I want to make here is that for any kernel g of x that you have, you can always figure out, well, not always, but in simple cases like the one I'm showing you, you can figure out the normalizing constant in the following simple way. It's an easy trick, right? There is some constant k that will make the area under the curve sum to 1. So what is that constant? How do I figure it out? I just solve for k, right? So all I have to do is find out what this unknown variable is, and it's going to be 1 over the integral of this, this entire term here. It's just simple algebra. I'm not doing anything sophisticated here, right? And so what I want to show you here, that the normalizing constant, at least in these simple cases, can always be worked out later if you know what the kernel is, right? You can always do this, right? in these simple cases at least. <clears throat> OK, so what's the story so far? We looked at some very important properties of the normal distribution. right? We figured out that the area under the curve gives us the probability of observing a range of possible values. right? And you can also, of course, calculate probabilities like, what's the probability of observing some number like 500 or something less than that, all the way to minus infinity? right? that you can also compute with the cumulative distribution function. And I showed you that the normal uh, probability density function has two parts, the normalizing constant right, and the kernel. And you can always work out uh, the normalizing constant, at least in these kinds of simple cases. Right. So what we're going to do now is we've seen what the normal distribution looks like and you know what the CDF might look like. and uh, what the PDF looks like, we are now going to use the same DPQR family of functions I showed you earlier to compute all these useful quantities that we did for the Bernoulli and the, and the binomial. We're going to do that in the continuous space now. That's the next lecture.